Okay. All right. So last week we sought to understand some key or basic concepts with microbiology. So we first of all wanted to understand or understood the concept of symbiosis or normal flora. And we said that this is the relationship between the hosts and yes. the relationship between a host and a parasite. And this relationship can either be beneficial or harmful. So the beneficial ones are what led us to the concept of normal flora. We said normal flora is a mixture of microorganisms we regularly find living at certain anatomical sites of the body. And you've got to understand that the, the eyes, the ears, the throat, your genital tract, the GIT, you might have some normal flora being present over there. Some areas of the body, the blood, the brain, the muscle, and the CSF said ideally should be sterile. Again, we looked at under what conditions these normal flora can be pathogenic. And we said when they move from their usual anatomic location, and then also when the individual comes immunocompromised. Any questions from last week's lecture before we go on? All right, so if there are no questions, um, if you do have one, just raise up your hands and I would proceed to unmute you and then you can ask your question. All right, so what we are going to today to look at some of the sides of the human body and also get to appreciate some of the microorganisms that we do have over there. So that if we do mention the skin, we have an idea of the microorganisms that are there. And so you can be able to distinguish between a genetic microorganism and one that is generally a normal flora. The first part or site of the body we are going to look at is the skin. Now, the skin is generally an unfavorable habitat for the growth of microorganisms due to the fact that it is exposed to periodic drying. And last week, we got to understand anywhere water is, microorganisms would like to grow. So the skin pair, the fact that it is exposed to the environment it is periodically dry, all right? And due to the dry nature of the skin, most microorganisms cannot thrive on the surface of the skin because for most microorganisms, you need a bit of moisture in order to grow. So because the skin is dry, most microorganisms cannot thrive over there. And as we go forward, we are going to understand that the areas of the body we find the highest amount of normal flora are places on the body where there's high amount of moisture. All right. So in your armpits, in your in and around your genital area, because of the relative high amount of moisture you might have over there, microorganisms might tend to thrive in these areas. Again, the acidic pH of the skin. Last week, we got to understand how acids 
affect the growth of microorganisms. And we said that most microorganisms cannot thrive in the acidic range, neither can they thrive in the basic range. The skin is slightly acidic, and due to this adaptation, most microorganisms cannot thrive on the surface of the skin. The skin also has an adaptation known as the presence of the high sodium chloride concentration. Now, if you've ever tasted sweat, either from yourself or from somebody, one of the things they are going to notice is that sweat is salty. So the presence of the salt is an adaptation of the skin to ensure that most microorganisms cannot grow. Last week, we had an extensive lecture on how salt affects the growth of microorganisms. And by extension, how we can apply this in the clinical setting, dressing for irrigation, etc. Because we've got to understand that the presence of salt draws water from microbial cells, which might contribute them to being eliminated. So as you do a strenuous activity and your body begins to produce fluids, they begin to sweat. In the event that there was no sodium chloride concentration in your sweat, what would have been expected to happen is that the amount of moisture will create an environment where these microorganisms will begin to thrive. So God in his wisdom ensured that Anytime you sweat or you produce a lot of sweat, as it comes onto the surface of your skin, the accompanying high sodium chloride to ensure that these microorganisms do not thrive. All right, so it's nature's own way of ensuring or controlling the growth of microorganisms. Other than that, we would have had a lot of microorganisms growing on the surface of our skin. When you sweat, and the skin comes onto your surface, it evaporates. Now, as it evaporates, it leaves crystals of salt on the surface of your skin. That is why when somebody sweats or somebody has gone to play football, has gone to the gym, and the person comes back, and you taste the person's skin, it feels salty. Because of the fact that sweat, the water has evaporated, and what you have been left on the surface of the skin are remnant of the sodium chloride concentration. If it wasn't for that, a lot of us would have had um, skin infections after we've engaged in some of these practices. Now, most of the skin microbes are associated with glands. So we have the eccrine glands, we have the apocrine glands, and we have the sebaceous glands. Eccrine and apocrine glands are related to sweat. The sebaceous glands or the fatty glands are related to the hair follicle. Now, our understanding of microbiology would help us to be able to look at some particular occurrences that would happen in our patients or in our environment. One of the first things that we do realize is that because these microbes are associated with the sweat glands, anytime we begin to sweat, we see a corresponding increase in the activity of these microorganisms because these microorganisms are associated or are found close to the sweat glands. So as you sweat, you see that these microorganisms increase in activity. And by increasing in activity, that is what leads to the production of some of the body odor that we all might have anytime we do carry out a um, strenuous activity or we begin to sweat in some parts of our body. So our underarms, our genital areas, that is what happens. So the event that we do not use, a deodorant, a perfume, etc., cetera, you see that anytime we sweat, our, our eccrine glands, apocrine glands, begin to be much more active. And so we see the microorganisms also becoming much more active. When they become much more active, that is when we see the production of the body odor. If you have not engaged in any activity or you are not sweating in these areas, your body will not produce any odor because the microorganisms are not active. 
the moment you begin to sweat, they begin to take advantage, become active to the production and body others. And that is why you might have realized that before the advent of our perfumes, our uh, body uh, products, etc., in the olden days, we used to apply lime in and around our armpit, primarily because lime is a highly acidic agent. So by applying it in and around our armpit, we'll be able to control the growth of microorganisms. All right, so what we used to do some time ago, basic understanding was that use of the lime, the lemon, or the acidic agents would help to control the growth of microorganisms. Then again, we have the sebaceous glands. These sebaceous glands are primarily fatty glands. Now, the normal flora we have on our face are a key contributing factor for those of us or for patients with high amount of uh, pimples or breakouts on their face. Now, the presence of pimples or acne or breakouts on your face, in most cases, the factor is the presence of microorganisms that is found on your face. So when these microorganisms begin to increase in activity, that is what leads to the production or to the presence of some of these severe aches that we do know of. So now anytime somebody has severe acne, you might see the clinician prescribing some antibiotics. The simple reason being that to get rid of the underlying, you have to get rid or control or bring down the normal flora or the bacterial organisms that are beginning to overgrow on the person's face or on the person's skin. So we try to advise you that do not touch or use your hands near your face. Simple reason being that as you bring your hand to your face, you are introducing microorganisms into your face. What we might hear that taking fatty food might lead you to having pimples or breakouts is not entirely true. It is a contributing factor. All right, but that is not what causes the direct breakout or development of pimples. What we do see is that the fatty food, dairy, the milk, the cheese that we take are contributing factors because they are going to end up clogging our pores or the holes in our skin. The contributing factor to some of these severe acne or pimples or breakouts is presence or the overgrowth of microorganisms on your face or on the surface of your skin. Dermatologists will tell us to ensure that our skin, we cleanse it very well to ensure that microorganisms do not harbor and overgrow on our skins or particularly in our faces. So some common microorganisms, you might have staph epidermidis, propionic bacterium, ichneus, and you might, even some, you might even have cases of streptococcus being found on the surface of the skin. So propionic bacterium acne is one of the commonest organisms we find in the severe pain or Now the oral cavity. So, with regards to the human body, the three sites in the human body with the largest amount of microbial organisms or organisms. We have the large intestine, female adult vagina, and the mouth. Now, oral cavity has a lot of microorganisms in there. And with the oral cavity, a lot of these microorganisms feed on the remnants of food we leave in our mouth. 
So the source of nutrients for most of the microorganisms we have in our mouth is the food that we eat. So by extension, tooth decay, plaques, caries, that you might see patients having is primarily due to the normal flora we have in our mouth. Here's what happens. These microorganisms inhabit our mouth. So as we eat and we leave remnants of food in our mouth, they would feed on the food you have left in your mouth. And as they feed on it, they would use that to multiply, to grow, and this is what leads to the dental caries, the plaques, and the tooth decay that we might experience. So I'm sure that when um, we were young, or even as we are raising our children up now, tell them or we try to not let them eat a lot of sugary stuff, sugary sweets, toffees, candies, etc. The basic reason being that the more you take in these sugars, they serve as substrate for the growth of the microorganisms. Because these microorganisms like the sugars. So if you eat and then there are lots of sugars left in your mouth, you take advantage, you start to multiply. And then that is the major cause of the tooth decay, dental carry that you might experience. So the advice is that as much as possible, we try to carry out brushing twice a day, in the morning and before we go to bed at night. In the morning, we get up, take our breakfast, we do everything. As we are going up and down, we are eating the various kinds of foods, we get microorganisms or we leave remnants of food in our mouth. And as we leave this remnant of food in our mouth, if we go throughout the daily activities and we do not brush at night, by sleeping, these bacterial organisms, Fusobacteria, Actinomycetes, Spirochetes, Privotella, they would feed on the remnant of food that you and I have left in our mouth, and then they are going to begin to multiply. All right? And that is why you might see that anytime we do sleep and we wake up in the morning, our breath does not feel as fresh. Primarily, in that period of time, these microorganisms would have multiplied and to the production of some of these others. So for those that do not brush twice a day, the advice is that if you want to reduce your risk of developing dental plaques, dental caries, tooth decay, then please try to ensure that are carrying out nighttime brushing. And I'm not talking about the one that you go and brush, and after that you say you're still hungry, so you want to go and fry some egg. No, I'm talking about the one that you do last thing before you sleep. So you, before you sleep, you go to your washroom, your bathroom, do that. And I know for 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 some people after brushing they feel hungry. But please drink water. If after brushing you feel hungry, please drink water. Last thing you need to do is after brushing, oh, this one, let me take some small coke bean to pass. You've not done anything. All right. So please, if you don't want to grow up and then have dental caries, then try to ensure that uh, you are taking care of your. Your oral health, very, very important. And also we advise that because, you see, because of where these remnants of food, these microorganisms live, in some cases our brushes cannot even reach them. That's why for most of us, we might have yellowish, greenish portions. They are just basically growth of microorganisms in some parts of our teeth. Our brushes cannot reach them. All right. That is why we recommend that every, at least twice a year, all right, every six months, go to your dentist so that he does a better cleaning by getting rid of tiny microorganisms that are in places that your brush cannot reach. 
because the longer they stay there, the higher your risk of developing dental caries. For some of these dental infections or dental conditions, um, the effects can be quite severe, where it can even lead to the total extraction of the tooth. Mercy, what of leptin without sugar and milk? Oh, a leptin also contains some um, agents that these microorganisms might want. All right, so just drink water, preferably just drink water, and it will it will fill your stomach, and then you can you can sleep. You drink water, and you start counting from a thousand, like backwards thousand, nine 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 eight nine nine seven. By the time you get to one, you'd be tired and would have fallen asleep. All right. Okay. Now the respiratory tract. Now, when it comes to our respiratory tracts, you have the upper part and the lower part. Now, the upper part of our respiratory tract is our nasopharynx, our, our oral cavity, our throat. And in these places, we have a wide assortment of microorganisms. Now, the hair in your nose is there for a purpose. The mucus that we have in our noses are there for a purpose. All of these are to ensure that trap microorganisms as we breathe in the air. In that environment, we are in the Hamatan season now, a lot of microorganisms will be circulating around. The presence of the hair, the mucus, is there to trap these microorganisms. Now, there was, um, I was reading a report today by the Ghana Health Service where they're expecting an increase in some common respiratory tract infections, all right? Because we are in the dry season and the hamatan season. For most of us, we, we are going to realize that our noses will be very, very dry. So the mucus that otherwise would have trapped some of these microorganisms are no longer as effective. All right, our throats will begin to get dry. All of these are to ensure that the presence of all of these fluids in other times of the year are to ensure that we trap microorganisms. And in the Hamilton season, all of these fluids generally get what? Dry. So as we kill and these microorganisms might easily move through our throat, our noses, and then move down into the lower part of our respiratory system. During the hamatan, we might experience all of these because some of these adaptations that our body has developed to control microorganisms are no longer there. All right, so you have a lot of microorganisms in your throat, in your mouth, your nasal pharynx. All of these are perfectly normal. They are there as a normal flora. All right. So we try to advise that for those that would like to completely cut all the hair in their nostrils, it is not entirely beneficial, all right? Because some of these tiny hair is there for a particular purpose. To ensure that our bodies are able to trap some of these microorganisms. Now, upper part of our respiratory system, microorganisms are there. Your nose has a lot of microorganisms in there. That's why you are told not to pick your nose without washing your hands after. After picking your nose, you should use the tissue. If you decide to use your hand, you try to sanitize your hand right after. Also, the amount of microorganisms we have in our throat. However, as we go down to the lower part of our respiratory system, the trachea and then the lungs, for these areas, they are completely sterile. For them, the of microorganism over there is telling you that your patient has an infection. In the throat, the presence of the microorganism might just be a normal flora. All right. So, for instance, somebody might have a sore throat or a common throat infection. 
we might tell the person to use warm salt water. All right. You will not give any particular drug. We'll give the person some home remedies. You, the midwife, will tell the patient, take some salt, you know, mix it, and then gargle it in the throat. Because you are actually applying the concepts we are learning now. Now, for most of these throat infections, it might be due to an overgrowth of your normal flora, particularly your nasal pharynx or your throat. So by using the salt water, it will help to control the growth of microorganisms. However, when we go down to the lungs and then the trachea, for these places, any microorganism you see over there cannot be a sign of a normal flora you are actually looking at an infection. So with that, you have to take extreme care and treat it as emergency as early as possible because it is not due to any normal flora which is overgrowing. It is actually a sign of an infection. So do we now see the difference? So if we are to take swabs from each and every one of us, our throats, we might see a lot of microorganisms there. They are not a sign of an infection. At the moment, your patient produces sputum. That is why when somebody is having a chest infection or an infection of his respiratory system, ask the patient to produce sputum. Now, sputum is a substance produced from the lower part of our respiratory system, from our trachea down to the deeper parts of our throats. So by producing the the sputum will paint a picture of what microorganisms are found in the lower part of your respiratory system. So that is why when you are diagnosing somebody for a chest infection, most cases we don't take saliva or any products from the throat. We like to go deeper and make the patient produce sputum because the sputum comes down from the lower part of our respiratory system and then will tell us what microorganisms we are seeing over there. Do we get enough? So in the upper part, yes, microorganisms are there. In the case of a tiny infection, we can use home remedies, pour lime into water, drink it, take some honey, because we know that we are basically controlling the growth of microorganisms. Lime, we know is acidic, but it helps to control the microorganisms. All right. The moment you are going down to your trachea and your lungs, then you are looking at a much more serious and severe infection, which you should immediately try to tackle. All right, so patients, patients to take us back about the sebaceous gland. Now, when it comes to that and then how it affects hormonal levels during menstruation, like you said, that is primarily down to changes in hormonal level. All right. With that, we do not see a lot of microbial activity playing a role in the hormonal levels would affect that. But under any other condition or under normal circumstances, apart from this time period of menstruation, for most cases of severe acne, we are looking at the overproduction or the overgrowth of some of these normal flora. Nancy, in your case, I will, I'm assuming that um, could be a sign of a much more serious condition and you should perhaps go and see um, a clinician. All right. I don't see the relation between that and then um, the microbial organisms. So we are saying the respiratory system, the upper part has microorganisms, the lower part should be sterile. The moment the lab tells you that they identify the microorganism from the lower part or from a patient's sputum, straight away, you should tackle that as an emergency. All right. And we have the GIT. Now, the GIT, we've broken them down into three parts. We have the stomach, 
small intestines and the large intestines. Now, first of all, the stomach, because of the high amount of acids we have in there, is generally unfavorable for the growth of microorganisms. Stomach, we have very, very few microorganisms inhibiting there as a normal flora. Very, very few. However, as we go down to the small intestines and the large intestines, we see an increase in the amount of normal flora over there. This is so because as we go down the GIT, we see a change in the pH, moving from the acidic much more to the neutral and maybe to the basic ranges. So as we go down the GIT, the stomach has a pH of two, so a lot of these microorganisms cannot thrive because of the high amount of acids. And as we go down, we see the pH increasing to 4.5 and then to seven. Seven is found in the large intestines and here we see a lot of microorganisms that are found there. So let me ask, in giving, when you give your patients antibiotics, what are some of the commonest symptoms that you see them, side effects, see them experiencing when you give them um, oral antibiotics? All right, so some are saying nausea, vomiting, uh, uh, quite a number are saying diarrhea, diarrhea, rashes, diarrhea. All right. Susanna says flatulence. Okay. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. All right. So one thing we are seeing in here is that Diarrhea seems to be running through. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Diarrhea seems to be running through. Why do you think this is so? Why do you think that diarrhea seems to be running through almost, in most cases we, we get to experience that. What, what do you think is happening? As you, you are telling me that you see diarrhea, all right? I'm asking, why do you think that is happening? What exactly is causing this diarrhea that almost all of us are agreeing that is one of the common side effects of antibiotic, oral antibiotic intake? All right, the patient says, yeah, due to the acidic secretions. Okay, any other view? All right, Belinda says, Bragu says, the dead micro, the dead microbes, the dead microorganisms. All right, Emilia says, irritation of the stomach lining and rectum. All right, am I right? Yes, irritation of the stomach lining and rectum. All right, so now we are going to understand why this happens, all right? And all of this is due to the normal flora that we have inhibiting the microorganisms or inhibiting our GIT. Now, all of the points that we've mentioned could contribute in one way or the other. 
But what we mainly see is that antibiotics we take are to target a particular bacterial organism, right? We all agree on that. Are to target a particular bacterial organism. But one of the things that we do see is that these antibiotics do not, so many of them do not distinguish between this is the harmful antibiotic and these are the beneficial ones. All right, so there is this chemical I have. This chemical targets only fair women in a particular group. So I come to a class and then there are a mixture of people there, all right? And then this chemical I spray in there. And then it is to, it is to target a particular fair lady by name, um, Susanna. All right. So the drug will go and get rid of Susanna. But that same drug will go and get rid of Ephia, Mansa, Ajua, simply because they are fair. Do we get it? So you're taking the antibiotic is to get rid of E. coli. All right. So after getting rid of E. coli, then we see what we refer to as the collateral damage. You see, when there's a war, two soldiers would end up fighting, two groups of soldiers would end up fighting. But you see that children and mothers and civilians on the other side would end up being killed. Same thing we see here. So you're taking the drug to go and get rid of this particular organism causing the infection to you. After getting rid of the organism, it ends up destroying some of your beneficial microorganisms as well. And once they do disrupt, or end up destroying the beneficial microorganisms, what we do see is that there's one organism known as Clostridium difficile. So this Clostridium difficile will then take advantage of the fact that the beneficial ones have been killed and then they are going to multiply. So once they begin to multiply, that is what would lead to a disruption and like Emilia said, an irritation of the intestinal lining. And as a result of that, it leads to the development of diarrhea. So the nausea, the vomiting, the diarrhea, these groups of infections or symptoms sorry, that you are seeing is primarily due to a disruption in the normal flora. Because your antibiotics got rid of the organism that is causing the infection. But at the same time, it ended up destroying other beneficial organisms. When that happens, Clostridium difficile would then take advantage, it's a normal flora, would then take advantage of this happening and cause the presence or development of the diarrhea. So usually the diarrhea that you see your patient having after antibiotic refer to that as antibiotic mediated diarrhea or Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea. Clostridium is the underlying factor causing the diarrhea to happen simply because it has disrupted your, your intestinal lining due to the disruption of your normal flora by the antibiotic that you actually took. So you take the antibiotic to get rid of the harmful microorganism causing the infection, but then it ends up destroying your beneficial ones as well. When that disruption happens, then we see the development of the diarrhea. So when your patients have diarrhea after antibiotic, it is perfectly understandable. It is due to a disruption of the normal flora. Moment it stops, the normal flora would resume, or they would find ways to colonize your body back, and the diarrhea would subside. Are we getting it now? Very good.
All right, so Fatimata is asking that. Um, she experiences constipation, right? When I take in antibiotics, can there be a different explanation to? Well, one that we primarily know is that antibiotics would affect or would disrupt the normal flora that you have in your stomach. Oh, sorry, in your large intestines, small intestines. And one of the commonest side effects of this is the diarrhea, vomiting, etc. However, there are some cases where you might see some other gastrointestinal symptoms like what you are experiencing. All right. In this case, the constipation could be due to the fact that you do not stay hydrated, you don't take in a lot of fruits and vegetables, etc. But the key thing is that the antibiotic intake generally affects the balance of the normal flora and your gastrointestinal health. The commonest side effects that most people would experience is the diarrhea. However, for cases where we are seeing constipation, it could be due to some other factors playing a role in there. But the commonest side effects is the diarrhea and some of these related Fatima, do you understand it? So you could be an outlier or a slightly different case from what you generally would know or expect. But you can do other things to help control it. Being hydrated, taking your fruits and vegetables, your fibers, your fresh sugars, your probiotics, that might also help in controlling the situation. All right, then we have the genital urinary tract. Now, when it comes to the urinary system or genital urinary system, we have the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra, all right? All right, patient is asking, does this principle apply to all oral medications? There are so many oral medications we take, all right? Paracetamol is an oral medication, NSAIDs can be oral medication, etc. But we mainly see this particular diarrhea resulting from antibiotics, all right? So antibiotics are mainly where we see this, all right? Where we've clearly seen this particular phenomenon happening. But for oral medication then, um, we might be looking at some other underlying factor. But when it comes to microbiology or microorganisms, mainly see antibiotics as the main causative um, factor for this particular um, diarrhea that you might experience. Right. Now with the urinary system, we have the kidneys, ureters, and the bladder as well as the urethra. And these are the various parts that make up the urinary system. Now, when it comes to this system, ideally, we are wanting the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladder to be sterile. Ideally, there should be no microorganism found in these places. The moment you have microorganisms being found in the bladder, the ureters, or climbing up to the kidney, that is when you see the development of the UTI. So anytime you hear somebody is having a UTI infection, all that we are primarily trying to tell you is that the upper part of the urinary system, the kidneys, the ureters, or the bladder, might have been infected or exposed 
to microorganisms. So UTIs are just basically an infection of the kidneys, the ureters, or the bladder. When it comes to the urethra, when it comes to the urethra, we have some amount of normal flora over there. All of us, every single one of us, you have to take your urine. We are going to find some amount of normal flora in there. This amount of normal flora we have in there is due to the, some of the common microorganisms we find in your urethra. So for most people, if you have to take your urine, you're going to have some normal flora in the microorganisms in there. The only way for us to tell that you have a UTI infection and compare that to somebody who has microorganisms is the amount or number. So if you are healthy, there's a particular number of microorganisms we expect to find in your urine because these are the normal flora that we generally have in the urethra. The moment somebody has a UTI, that is what you might have heard as urine culture, right? The take the urine sample and we count the amount or the number of microorganisms in there. When it exceeds certain numbers, then we know that no, this cannot be a normal flora that is found in the urethra, but it's actually a sign of a much more severe infection inside the patient. So for instance, for pregnant women, you might see them having recurrent UTI infections, right? Relatively much more common than other people of the, 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 the population. So why do you think this is so? You see a much more recurrent um, infection pregnant women than in other members of the population. You are midwives, so I'm sure you might have encountered this a few times. Oh, so let's say that my wife is pregnant or my, my, my side chick is pregnant and then she's having recurrent UTI. Then I bring it to you that, oh, um, I'm a midwife. Why is my lady having recurrent UTI? Why do you think, what explanation would you give me if I say that, no, it is somebody in her house who is doing her? But you said that no, it is perfectly normal or it is expected. What reason would you give? All right, um, Priscilla says that due to the stasis of urine, so the um, accumulation of urine, okay. Penaman says hormonal imbalance. Due to the frequent urinating, and one day do not dry the vulva well before putting on the pants. All right, so we are going to start this message from Esther and come back to it. Due to frequent urinating, when they do not dry the vulva well. The excess work of the lactobacilli. Okay, so now there are so many reasons. All right, Menson says due to the stasis of urine as a result of elongation 
of the UHS. All right. Now, what we basically see is that as the child or the baby is developing inside the mother's womb, the fetus is developing inside the mother's womb, there seems to be a downward pressure on the bladder. That is what will lead to, in some cases, the frequent urination. All right, my contribute to that. It's a downward pressure on the bladder. The baby forces down on the bladder. So ideally, we said the bladder should be what? Sterile. But here is what we see. As the fetus pushes down on the bladder, we see a shortening. A shortening of the urethra and then the bladder. So this is where the urethra is. So we see the, the force from the baby pushing this down. So it shortens the distance between the urethra and the bladder. And remember, we said the urethra has some amount of normal flora over there. So when it is shortened, then it becomes much more easier for these microorganisms to move to the bladder and cause some of the common UTIs that pregnant women might experience. All right, so you see that anytime the fetus is developing, it pushes down. This woman might begin to experience frequent urination, et cetera, so many other things. But when it comes to the presence of microorganisms, what we do see is that as the bladder is pushed down, we see a shortening of the urethra and the bladder. And when this happens, it becomes very, very easy or much more easier for the microorganisms, the normal flora in your urethra to move to a different anatomic site, like the bladder, where they no longer become a normal flora, but then they become pathogenic. All right, so this is one of the underlying factors behind the reason why you're pregnant to men every now and then would be having um, recurrent UTIs. So we ask them to drink a lot of water to flush it out. All right, good. But when it comes to urinary system, the presence of microorganisms can only be found in the distal end of the urethra. So in the case of pregnant women, you might see all UTIs because of, like I said, the easy movement of the normal flora from the urethra to the bladder. And as a result, it slightly increases the mother's chance of developing some of these urinary tract infections. Yes, um, is there a hand up? Matilda. Yes, Matilda, go ahead. Hello, sir. Yes. Please, I need to ask you a question. Uh, why is it that the, some doctor will write a, a test that will go and do a test? And the doctor will tell you, go and do RE, urine RE, and go and do, at the same time, culture sensitivity. But you will do the test, and the RE will be negative, but the CS will be positive. What is the reason? Please. All right. So you are told to go and do a test, a urine RE, and a culture, right? I saw a question here. That's why I'm laughing. Everybody should go and read Christiana's question. It's, it's very interesting, right? So you are supposed to go and do a urine RE and a culture. Then... <laughs> and your urine ARI might come out um, negative, according to you, but then the culture comes out positive. Now, first of all, you should understand that what each of these tests are used. All right. Now, your urine area, we are mainly going to look at the cells that are found in your urine. 
All right, so for your urine IV, once we get the urine, we do a number of things. We might test for the, the sugar in your urine, the nitrites, the proteins, etc. The urine IV is more of looking at the function of your kidney. Your kidneys are supposed to trap some of these um, solutes for making sure that they do not pass in your urine, come out in your urine. All right. So your urine IV is more indicative of the function of the organs. How are the organs functioning? If you have an infection, what cells are being produced to fight that particular infection? So for urine IV, we are looking at color, the specific gravity, the if there's any blood in there, if there's any sugar in there, there are any proteins in there, epithelial cells, past cells. So we are looking at physical things that your body would produce to indicate an infection or to fight an infection. Matilda, do you get that part? Yes, please, sir. Good. So now culture, we do culture to identify the microorganisms. So that's the difference here. A culture will not be looking at the type of cells that are produced by your body. No. Anytime we do urine culture, we are trying to identify particular microorganisms causing the infection inside your patient. So under ideal conditions, do the urine IV first, which is more physical, all right? We place it in the dipstick, we put the recordings, and then it tells us that, okay, there might be a problem with the urinary system. Is this caused by a microorganism? Then we do a culture. So if it is caused by a microorganism, we are going to be told that there is this particular microorganism your urine. So a culture is to identify the microorganism and then the urine iris to look at some of the cells and other physical features. So somebody's urine iris might come out as negative, but then might be positive for a particular microbial infection. To tell you that the microorganism is found in the person's ureters, kidney, bladder, but the damage is not extensive, or the body has not started fighting it by producing some of the epithelial and past cells that we. All right. At the same time, somebody can have what you are going to refer to as a positive urine culture, where we have a lot of epithelial cells, a lot of past cells, but might retain a negative culture. Why? Because the damage to the person's kidneys or ureters or bladder might not be caused by a microbial organism. It might be caused by any other damage or injury or physiological factor. Matilda, is it a bit clearer now? So there are two okay, different okay. tests, two different people. Although together we use them to paint a broad picture. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, so I think your colleagues are trying to um, 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 help us here. So Anastasia is saying that it's because urine is under microscope, might be negative to stains, but with culture, so under the microscope, mainly do not look out for bacteria organisms. So with urine IRI, we are looking out for parasites. You cannot identify bacterial organisms from a urine IRI. So I think that's what she's trying to say. It might be negative under the microscope. Culture will tell us the particular bacteria organism. And then Linda says that, then she only requests for urine culture when there's recurring team urine IRI. All right, so she's saying that when urine IRI, somebody might be positive. It could be due to so many factors. At the moment somebody has recurring infection or the urine IRI keeps returning positive, 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 then they are going to request a culture to identify the microorganisms. All right, so we have to understand the difference between the two. Yes, Linda, your, your hand is up. Uh, 
Okay, so please, with urine um, culture, so when the result is out, they list some antibiotics on the form, like cefrozyme, um, keftriazone, and then they write that sensitive or resistant. So please, I want to ask the meaning of those things with regards to the antibiotics. Okay. Uh, Linda, why didn't you ask them? Why didn't you go and ask them? Uh, <laughs> everything is for you. You just, you just go back there and ask them why they've written that for you. What does it mean? Okay. <laughs> All right. So basically, we do that to help you in your treatment. So what we do, that is what we refer to as sensitivity. So culture is growing it. Sensitivity is determining which antibiotic is most effective. All right. Culture is determining which particular microorganism is there. Sensitivity is determining which antibiotic is effective for that particular microorganism. Because like we say, um, not all fingers are the same. The microorganism that you might respond to using cefrozyme, patient A. Patient B might not respond to it. So we try to do that for each patient to tell you that, okay, that the patient you have in front of you, don't use cefrozyme for him or her. It will not work. Rather, use keftriazone or use meropenem. So the sensitivity, the resistant one, in time you see the R, it is telling you that don't use it. For that particular patient, any human. But anyway, you see S, it is telling you that it is actually chemically effective. I think your question is answered now. Linda. Is it clear? Can we go on? Yes, sir, please. It's okay. Thank All right, you. Good. So now we've gotten to understand. Yes, hey, hand up. Yes, Mabel. Sir, please, Christiana's question, you didn't answer. Which one? Yeah, yeah, pepper one. Pepper one. Pepper one. Yes, sir. Ah, ah. Pepper. <laughs> If somebody can answer, I don't have an answer. If somebody can answer, you, you can all help us. Yeah, they've already answered her. They've already answered it. Yeah. Uh huh. Just when you take pepper, you drink water. I and the same one. You drink a lot of water, so you are going to urinate a lot. It has nothing to do with microorganism. The pepper will not enter the microorganism's eyes. Yeah. Okay. Um, put your hand up, Georgina. Yes, sir. Please. So, um, with regards to an infected client, anytime yeah. we are treating, we advise that a partner be also treated. Why is that so? Is it that <laughs> should the partner rather come and also do the test before treatment or he should just undergo treatment? I just want to know. For what Thank type you. of infection? UTI, I mean. All right. So now, because of the proximity between the female sexual organ and the urethra, urethral opening, generally we do believe that there's always a risk for some of these microbial organisms during sexual activity to move from the vagina into the urethra. So the event you are treating a patient for a UTI, you might expect that you treat the partner as well. Because if it was from the partner through sexual intercourse and then it's climbed its way up into the urethral opening, you might treat your female patient but she's going to go back and encounter it. Why? Because it was gotten through the sexual means or the microorganism up 
through the vagina to the urethral opening. That is why for some of these infections, we might recommend that treat both partners because the source might not necessarily be from the woman, but rather could be from sexual activity which oh, wow. introduce the bacterial organism to the woman. All right, good. So now when it comes to the genital urinary tract and the normal flora, we are done with the urinary system. Now let's go to the genital system. For the genital system, in women, we have three main groups of infections. In women, we have three main groups of infections when it comes to the genital and the urinary system. We have STIs, we have vaginal infections, and then we have UTIs. We've talked about UTIs extensively, and we are seeing that when the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, microorganisms are there, that is what basically leads to the development of UTIs. All right. Vaginal infections are completely different from UTIs. As you are aware, men would have only one opening for the passage of urine for sexual activity. So what we do see is that with men, they don't have anything known as penile infections. All right. With men, we have only two main groups of infections, STIs and then UTIs. Men would not have penal infections. With women we have three. We have the UTIs, we have the STIs, and then we have vaginal infection. So now let's look at what exactly happened in the vaginal infection. So the upper part we said the kidney, the ureters, is free from microorganisms. And in both male and female, a few bacteria are there. Now the risk of males developing UTI are generally much more lower than that of women. Simply because with men, if there's some amount of normal flora in and around the urethra, by the flashing action of the urine, what you see is that it washes it off. So men generally would tend to have a lower risk of contracting some of these common infections compared to women. All right. And nature has made in such a way that, for instance, after a sexual intercourse, both men and women, or more specifically men, will get the urge to pass out urine, primarily because of the fact that it is the body's own way of getting rid of some of these microorganisms that might have entered into the urethra. But with, with females, after the urethra, just below the urethra, we all know that there's a genital tract, a different ecosystem on its own. And the genital tract, because of its large surface area and mucous secretions, has a complex microbiota. It is one of the parts of the body with the highest amount of normal flora. Because of the large surface area, the moisture, and then the mucous secretions. Remember, we said that anywhere there's water, microorganisms would like to grow. So because of the relatively moist environment in and around the genital tract, microorganisms would like to grow. The balance of these microorganisms is what directly leads to the vaginal infections the patients might be encountering. For a healthy adult's vagina, the pH should be acidic. So we are looking at around two to four maximum. It should be acidic to control the growth of the microorganisms. And it's acidic because there's a particular microorganism referred to as lactobacillus acidophilus. And this particular microorganism helps to maintain the acidity of the vagina. So the moment per any activity of yours, you change the acidity from the acidic range 
to basic range, but all that you are enforcing is that you are allowing some of these microorganisms to actually thrive. The vagina we said should have an acidic pH. So, per its acidity, it helps to control microorganisms. The moment the balance is affected through any activity of yours, then you allow some of these microorganisms to thrive. And that is what leads to some of these things we refer to as vaginal infections. Vaginal infections are primarily, mainly, due to an imbalance of normal flora. STIs are gotten through sexual means. Vaginal infections are mainly through the imbalance in your normal flora. Once you know the difference, somebody cannot come to you and say that I have syphilis and it was because I sat on a public toilet. This cannot be true. Gonorrhea is an STI. Candida is a vaginal infection. All right. So for the healthy, for every healthy female, we only ask that as much as possible, ensure that chemicals, which is the first risk factor, is not introduced to the genital tract. So once we introduce these chemicals, they are going to alter the vagina. What other risk factor is there that can affect the pH of the adult vagina? All right, so age is age you can is not a behavioral factor per se, but yes, age is a contributing factor. All right, because as you age, the vaginal area gets drier. So one of the key things they need, the microorganisms need for growth, the mucus secretions are no longer there. All right, so age is a risk factor. I want the behavioral factor, the things that we do, that would introduce or increase our risk. All right, so um, Unice is douching. All right, very good. So the excessive cleansing of the genital area, in some cases applying chemicals. Now, the female genital tract is a self-cleansing system. Per nature, acidity, which we have talked about extensively, helps to control the growth of microorganisms. The use of chemicals are not widely encouraged because that is going to alter the recommend that you use large amounts, copious amounts of water, and that should be enough to maintain the balance of pH you have in the genital tract. The use of bathing soaps, chemicals, like we said, most of these bathing soaps are basic. The moment they encounter the acidity of the genital tract, they are going to reduce the pH and they are pushing it towards neutral or basic ranges. All right, so Mary says, um, say Mary, patients has made an interesting point. Not urinating after sexual intercourse. Patients, now that is more likely bound to lead to what? A urinary tract infection. As I want us to get the difference. There's a difference between UTI and the vaginal infections. You don't have sex through the, the, the urethral opening. All right. So 
not urinating after sexual intercourse more likely would lead to urinary tract infection and not vaginal infection. So improper way of wiping or cleaning perineal area, all right, the perianal area, right? There's a particular motion you are wiping away from genital area, all right? Once you wipe towards, you're just introducing microorganisms from one part of the body towards a different anatomic site. Once you wipe towards it, you're just taking your normal flora from one area to the other, and that can lead to severe um, infections. All right, so of course, use of certain drugs in the vaginal area is not advised because this is a self-cleansing system the introduction of chemicals would affect it. Now, the essence of this is that when your patient comes to you and then you are treating them for these recurrent vaginal infections, it's important that you educate them because if you give them the drugs, then you do not educate them. They're going to come back to you with some of these occurrences, all right, because the behavioral factors are still there. Okay. All right, so Mercy is asking, what about oral sexual I think we talked about it last week. At the moment, introduce normal flora, one site to another, your risk of developing an infection is high. All right, so also form, forming a part of some of the risk factors. Linda, you are saying what? What about ah? Is it? Is it? I don't get it. I know we we steam meat, beef, and then the rest, All right? So this steaming you are talking about. Please explain better, All right? So it's not it's not meat. So how can how can we steam? Okay. So explain it better so we can all get it. Yeah. So Rebecca is asking that. Intercourse lead to cause sexual infections since the penis or the sexual organ is not sterile. Now, I've said it over a few times, even now, there's a difference between an STI and then a general infection. So if you are developing any infection through sexual means, then it is more likely to be acting as what? An STI, all right? Because for most of these vaginal infections, they happen spontaneously due to an imbalance, due to all of these physical features or behavioral factors that we have talked about, all right? Nothing brings them. It's just primarily an imbalance of the pH. So if you're having any infection from sexual activity, that is classified as what? An STI. All right, so now if you are sitting on a water with chemicals, I've repeated it, do not want any chemicals in there. Be it in the gaseous form or the liquid form, do not want it in there. So Linda, whether it is with chemicals, then once you add the word chemicals, then we are going to advise you to stay away from it, simply because it's a self-cleansing system and there as much as possible chemicals should not be in there. All right, good. So now it's important that we understand this. All right, so now in rounding up, what are some of the common infections, genital infections that we do, vaginal infections that we do? So we've talked about them and a lot. So many of us have got, have given us the risk factors. We understand the underlying mechanism 
What are some examples? All right, so Mary, a genital urinary tract infection is a condition brought about by the presence of microorganisms in your genital system, urinary system. All right, a PID is the result. Remember, during our first lecture, we said we wanted to understand the difference between an infection and a disease. So the moment you say somebody has a PID, then you are basically telling us that the infection has led to classical signs and symptoms, causing a disorder in the body. All right. But if it's a PI infection, we are basically saying the microorganisms are there. All right. So some of these so urinary tract infections can lead to PID. So STIs also can lead to PID. All right, gonorrhea can lead to PID. All right, so any infection that affects your genital area has the tendency, or your, your urinary area has the tendency to spread and infect pelvic area. All right, so we have candida, Good. So now what is caused by herpes? Fusena said what? What is an STI? Herpes is an STI. All right. So we have vaginitis. We have candida. We have vaginosis. Bacterial vaginosis. We have trichomoniasis. Now, you should take time out to read on these infections because as midwives, one of the commonest things you, you are going to encounter. So good. Steven says syphilis. Now, Steven, syphilis is an STI. Very good. So Esther has corrected you. It's an STI. So with vaginal infections, we mainly have three common ones. All right. We have... Candida, of course, are commonest. We have trichomoniasis. Also, we have bacterial vaginosis. And then in some cases, chlamydia can be vaginal infection. All right. So there are differences in how these will present. For instance, candida, we all know it will present as a milky discharge with the discharge having clumps in there. In three, we will say it has a purple. All right. I don't know how to say it in the other languages, but it's almost like curds, cheese. When milk is going bad, it begins to form curds. All right. That is how a candida discharge would most likely appear. Now, when you look at bacterial vaginosis, and candida is caused by a fungal organism. So you are going to give antifungals to get rid of that. Now, if you look at um, BV, what we refer to as bacterial vaginosis, that is caused by a bacterial organism. The discharge is very, very different. So with that, you are looking at a yellowish discharge. But the key thing with BV, which you should understand, is that there's the production of a fishy smell. All right. It is the production of fishy smell. The moment you see this smell, you should no longer begin to treat it like candida. So no work. You should rather be looking out for suitable antibiotics, antibacterial drugs to give. Then you can also have trichomoniasis, which you are going to get in a yellowish greenish discharge, accompanied with an itching. Then again, it's also different from the first two. It's caused by a protozoan organism. So in this case, we would recommend that you give the person metronidazole. All right. Now, the key thing is that not all infections, vaginal infections, are candida. Per the color, per the smell, per the consistency, you are going to be able to tell which one is which. All right. So for instance, um, some people might enter into a particular room 
and then can say that, okay, sexual activity has gone on simply because the partner or the lady might be having some form of BV, vaginosis, which will lead to the production of characteristics member. All right. So once you see that, then quickly you're not treating candida, you're treating what? BV. So the man comes to you and then says that, I'm a midwife, this is what my wife is experiencing. This is, this. how does it present? Oh, it comes out this way, that way. Then you're forming your hypothesis. You're looking at the type of infection to um, actually treat or look at. All right, so it's very important that we look at the various types of infections, read on them, and know how each of them presents so that we don't treat all of them as the same. Any questions before we end? Can you please stop marking the screen? Edith. Thank you. All right. So if there are no questions, um, I would make Right, so, good. so here are some common microorganisms we find living in a certain anatomical site. What I'm expecting you to understand, to know, you should be able to identify the areas, the microorganisms that are normal flora in them. So if I ask you that, or I give you a question, question 22, which of the following can serve as a normal flora in the mouth. I'm expecting to know some of the common microorganisms and you should be able to pick the odd one out. The essence is that once you see that particular microorganism, you should be able to tell that it's an infection or not. All right. Yes, Elizabeth, your hand is up. Um, please say, I wanted to ask about the nose. Please, if you touch, you frequently touch your nose and you are having some sores around the nose, inside the nose, is it caused by the normal flora or maybe it's a, a, another disease? If you frequently touch your nose, but there could be so yeah. many underlying mechanisms, mechanisms. So, many. so many. The best way, the what, best we way do, what we can do is that we have to get a diagnosis done, a culture done. And then the type of microorganism will tell us that, okay, is this the one of the normal flora we find on our bodies which is causing the infection? Or this is a different microorganism altogether, All right? Because it could be a viral infection could be a parasitic infection with so many groups of organisms. So only by diagnosis can we be able to tell whether it is viral, parasitic, or whether it's your normal flora, which is about growing particular Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um Yes, Sister Hannah, Christiana. Okay, Erica, go ahead. If Hi, hello, you. sir. Yes. Sir, please, I was asking about the epistasis, the bleeding through the nostrils, but it happens only during the Hamatan season. Is it an infection or is it a genetic um, thing? No, was that. The bleeding during the
the thing knows doing hammocks, and I think primarily it is down to it is due to their dry nature. All right, it's due to the dry nature of the environment. Skin becomes very dry, begins to break because moisture is important for maintaining the smoothness mm -hmm. or integrity. All right, of a particular mucosal surface. So the moment it begins to dry, break up, or be, begins to get dry, then the mucosal lining begins to break up. That's what you see happening as um, 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 blood coming out. All right, it's similar to a woman who is having unlubricated sexual intercourse. Because of the dry nature, the friction will cause the mucosal lining to be breaking up. That is what will lead to the small, small droplets of blood you see. Yes, Abigail, quickly, our time is almost Good afternoon, say. And um, please, yes. my question is, um, why is it that um, today you've made me understand that um, when someone does an exercise because of the sweat that comes out, after it dries up, it leaves the, um, the salts on our skin. And some people, they have this um, offensive smell. I know it's because of... Uh, the microorganisms that's why they have that smell but even if after they've taken their bath they still smell that um, they have this um, offensive smell why that one thank you i didn't know you were you were you were a smelling officer you were around and then smell no someone, <laughs> someone <laughs> passed by you can even smell it yeah now with, with this, then we would be expecting that is there an is there any other cause of that particular occurrence happening? Because in most of these cases, it's primarily due to the microorganisms and the metabolites or the gases that they produce from their activities. If you are having somebody this recurrent situation, then it will mean that the person might have an excess of some of these microorganisms, or these microorganisms might be a little bit too active for this particular person. Right? So in that case, the person would have to begin to use body deodorant or some particular agent that would help him to control their activity. Maybe his microorganisms are much more active than generally um, some of us. So he tend to use more of this body odor relatively much more than us. It could also be due to their hygiene. There's a way, there's a proper way to buy, proper way to clean the body to ensure that you reduce microbial numbers. All right. How how good is the person's hygiene? How proper is the person bad? And also, what type of microorganisms are they? Are they more active than their other members? general population. Yes, Erica. Sir, please, I'm taking you back to the oral cavity. Please, we have people that no matter the number of times they, that they brush their teeth, they still have bad odor. What is the cause of that? So many. many the halitosis is just bad breath not limited to only microorganisms. It could be limited to food, um, other physiological factors. Um, how dry is the mouth? All right. So many things contribute to that. All right. Are there any anatomical wounds or sores or ulcers in the person's mouth or in his um, ENT, nose and throat? All right. So halitosis is just the result. Either a microbial organism multiplying, or any other contributory factor. It is not only limited to microorganisms. There could be so many other um, factors responsible for that. All right, so if you go and take food, and then the food is not, or leaves a bad taste or bad odor, you are going to have halitosis. Not necessarily due to the microorganisms, the taste and um 
now that the food leaves behind it. All right. So it could be due to so many. Is there a sore? Is there an infection down the person's throat? And lead to the bad breath. All right. We are done, isn't it? All right. Some are asking for the slides. Um, I would make them available to you um, today. So the class shop can text me and then I'll send the slides. That will be the only handout I'll be giving out to you. And um, next week, you're asking for the first outline as well. All right. So I'll try to make that. Some are saying, Anastasia says that you want the topic before we close. I'm assuming that when you have the topic, you are going to study it, isn't it? All right, so I'm going to give you the topic. So next week, I'm going to ask the questions on it because I'm assuming that you are clamoring that you want it. So I'm going to give it to you so that next week I will not have to talk for an hour or two hours. I just mentioned them fast, fast, because would have. All right. So um, enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of class, and God will link it again next week. Class show can text me. Make the yeah, please, we didn't mention the topic. When I send it to you, you will know. Anastasia. All right. When I send it to you, I went to me. I'm basically going to be looking at the um the various groups of microorganisms. All right. The various types they are. Okay. Enjoy the rest and we'll meet again next week.